Today's lecture is Spanish colonization of Northern New Spain, institutions of colonization. What you are looking at here in this slide is the map of uh, New Spain. New Spain was the colony that was created by the Spanish in North America that later became what we know today as Mexico. It at one point included parts of Central America. It included um, parts of uh, what is today uh, the United States or the American Southwest. Uh, these boundaries have changed over time, and we are going to be uh, studying uh, those changes in uh, this class and also uh, you study a little bit of this in uh, Chicano Studies 101 as well as uh, if you take a uh, Latin American history or history of the Americas. So let's begin talking about Spanish colonization of Northern New Spain. The most important thing to uh, uh, keep in mind when studying this subject is understanding the purpose of Spanish colonization. When Christopher Columbus came to the Americas by uh, sponsorship of the Spanish uh, king and queen who had recently married their kingdoms and united uh, the wealth and uh, have uh, liberated uh, the uh, Spanish peninsula or Iberian Peninsula, as is known, uh, they uh, expected him to uh, come back with uh, resources, with uh, information that could uh, make them uh, some profits because it was an investment. So the Spanish came for uh, three reasons. Uh, the first one was empire, because at this point in history, we're talking about the late 1400s, early 1500s, European uh, kingdoms were competing against each other uh, for influence around the world. And at the beginning, it was only the Spanish and the Portuguese that were exploring. Uh, but eventually, uh, other European uh, powers or kingdoms uh, joined, such as the French, the, Span uh, the English, and uh, the Portuguese, the Dutch as well. Um, so, first reason is empire. Empire uh, means uh, that they uh, wanted to claim, they wanted to explore, they wanted to find land that they could claim for themselves. The next step after finding land was to build um, forts and permanent uh, settlements that would serve as buffers against competition of other European powers. The reason why they're looking for uh, this is so that they can uh, have access to new markets, uh, to people, and everything that comes with that. However, uh, establishing and maintaining a, a settlement, a fort, uh, or anything like that, uh, including the missions, is something that is extremely expensive. So it needs to be uh, funded by somewhere or someone. The next uh, is the American dream. The American dream is the possibility for individuals, in this case conquistadores, to find a way to make a fortune out of these uh, colonization projects. There has to be uh, some type of incentive behind uh, these people for them to uh, risk their lives uh, and leave, in some cases, everything behind. Also, uh, this is uh, what funds the uh, expeditions. And uh, 
uh, the king and queen of Spain would uh, find an out of this. And the three main institutions that uh, worked together uh, to make this function and be something that uh, could find success would be uh, the church. And the church did have an investment into this. And they also had expectations from this uh, investment, which was to uh, gain new souls of uh, the people that they found, the natives that they found. You also have the military that does a lot of the protection of these uh, settlements. And you have the civil government. All of these three work um, together, but also have uh, friction between one another because they may have different ideas of how to get things done. Some might, might be more abusive uh, with natives than others, or more defensive about natives than others, or more aggressive against native native people. So there is this uh, friction between these three uh, branches of the colonial power. The last one is um, religious conversion. The church, in this case the Roman Catholic Church, uh, also spent some resources to uh, make these expeditions possible. They gave the Spanish crown blessing or moral approval to come and colonize uh, in exchange for uh, the this colonial power to allow for different uh, factions of the Catholic Church to come and uh, deliver the good news and uh, engage in missionary work. So the church wants to save the souls of many people convert these people and eventually these people by converting them they would be assimilated into the assimilating into the system the beliefs the spiritual beliefs of the system and they would become part of the system and will help the system expand and by the system I mean the colonial enterprise and that's exactly what happened so when you think about these three reasons for the purpose of colonization for in Spain I call it the three G's. Not just me. I think this is something that is used in, in this uh, topic in history. The three G's are God, the religious conversions and the involvement of the church. Glory. This refers to empire and uh, giving glory to Spain and being able to plant a flag and claim territories and lands in the name of the Spanish crown. And Gold. And gold is, uh, in this case, referring to the American dream. You have many um, Spanish conquistadores or soldiers that come because they feel that they're going to have an opportunity to strike rich and to make a fortune and be able to come back to Spain uh, or live here in uh, New Spain uh, with a very uh, wealthy lifestyle. So the three G's are the reasons why the Spanish end up settling in what is called the quote unquote uh, new world. Okay. This is a quote uh, from uh, the book that is a primary source by Bartolomé de las Casas called uh, A Brief Account of the Devastation of the Indies written by a, by a priest or friar where he gives a an account of what he witnessed in the Caribbean and other places in the Americas in terms of the violence, the abuse uh, that was uh, committed against the indigenous people, peoples of uh, the Americas 
in the hands of the Spanish colonial machine. When the Spanish come, they create or they bring in different systems of uh, organizing this colonial enterprise. One of them is called the repartimiento or the distribution of indigenous peoples. One of the things that happen is that for the soldiers to be motivated to participate and to engage in uh, battle, to travel, to struggle, to sacrifice, to expose themselves to so many different things, there had to be a reason or some, some type of incentive or a set of incentives for them to do those things. And the Spanish crown created those incentives, and those incentives included name and titles, uh, positions of power, uh, land as a way of uh, rewarding them for their service, especially when something big was achieved or was uh, prevented from happening. But they did not only get land, they also got land and people uh, that were attached to the land to work for them in exchange for protection. So Spanish conquistadors also and soldiers end up uh, getting rewarded by the Spanish crown by getting access to land and native people to work that land for them, to pay tribute to them uh, because this, these people are representing the Spanish crown. This leads to something called the encomienda system. The encomienda system is a system in which these native people are uh, put in the hands of these Spanish soldiers or conquistadores or noble class people uh, in exchange for guardianship and also to help native people uh, convert and assimilate into Spanish culture. So you would have, as a result, Spanishized natives, native people that would adopt Spanish Catholicism and eventually adopt Spanish and live by the rules and the culture of the Spanish colonial system. Therefore, indigenous peoples were base, uh, vassals to, uh, to the crown and therefore had, also, had to also pay taxes and incorporate themselves into uh, the system, the Spanish colonial system. When they could not pay uh, taxes or tribute to the Spanish, they would have to uh, pay uh, by providing personal services, in some cases slavery, uh, even though uh, in the Spanish colonial law, there were uh, the Spanish uh, soldiers or Spanish um, encomenderos were not supposed to be uh, abusing this system. They did. And this led to a lot of resentment, a lot of resistance, and of course not many natives wanted to uh, play the rules of the Spanish. Uh, they, many of them wanted to continue to be free, but also many native people ended up becoming dependent on the Spanish and the missions and uh, this system that was introduced. Here's a euro about this system um, because uh, European uh, colonialism happened not just in the Americas, it happened all over the world. And this is a mural that depicts a lot of this history uh, that was uh, pushed forward all over the world. This class, you're going to be reading uh, the book, uh, The Crucible Struggle by Zaragoza Vargas. And uh, I want to briefly take a minute to uh, go over how this book is broken down into. Uh, how it's broken down so you can understand how you're reading this. Uh, it starts uh, with uh, speaking, talking about the three periods of Spanish colonization in the uh, northern New Spain uh, frontier. 
I guess with uh, Juan de Oñate and his expedition from Durango uh, to what would become Nuevo Mexico or New Mexico. This is land that had been explored in the past by people like Cabeza de Vaca and Coronado. Uh, in Chicano Studies 101, we talk about uh, Cibola and the seven cities of gold, uh, which refers to a time in which Spanish uh, explorers spent some time in uh, these same territories, including uh, the, the plains, uh, and interacted with native people uh, from Florida all the way through uh, the Midwest and uh, back to uh, California. And uh, couldn't find the gold that they were looking for. So the Spanish had come through this area in the past, uh, but it is in uh, 1598 that Juan de Oñate de Salazar um, goes to Mexico City, the capital of New Spain, and asks for um, support from the Viceroy, the Viceroy meaning the representative of the Spanish crown in this colony of New Spain, uh, but the Viceroy um, expresses to Juan de Oñate that there is not really much he can do for him. However, he could, he can uh, give uh, Juan de Oñate a uh, special status in which he would automatically become um, the governor of this new to be found colony of New Mexico as long as he uh, funded his own expedition. Juan de Oñate was a uh, wealthy uh, Spaniard, peninsular, if you will, who had access or had various uh, mines in Zacatecas, in Durango, and various other places. And from these uh, monies or these uh, resources, plus uh, the help of some of his uh, also friends, he was able to uh, secure the funding for this expedition. He establishes a colony in uh, New Mexico. Things don't go well. And eventually that leads to something called the Pueblo Revolt of 1680, which is one of the most important uh, revolts that happened in uh, northern New Spain. We're going to be talking about this a little bit later. Eventually the Spanish come back, they retake New Mexico, they decide to reorganize this territory, and um, they uh, reinvest, retake, and then we'll talk all the way about all the way to uh, Mexican independence and what happens uh, with people uh, living in these territories in places like Texas, Nuevo Mexico, and Alta California. So that's how the uh, the book uh, is divided, and we're gonna divide this into smaller pieces and talk about this. Uh, in uh, a little bit later, but um, stay tuned to that. Uh, Spanish uh, institutions of uh, colonization, uh, one of the most important uh, institutions and one of the main reasons why the Spanish came and uh, a place where funding came from is uh, the church. So missions play a, a huge uh, role in uh, the colonization of Northern New Spain. Uh, so, depending on what uh, specific colonial territory, uh, things happen a little bit different. Uh, they had the same purpose, but uh, the building, the position of these uh, missions was different. So, for example, in New Mexico, there was a very strong dependency between the Spanish and the native people, the Pueblo. So, they, uh, the Spanish built the missions uh, very near Indian villages because the Pueblo traditionally were uh, raided by uh, Navajo Indians, 
So they uh, depended on the protection for the Spanish. Uh, at the same time, they were at the same time they were also abused by the Spanish. But there was a dependency in Texas. Uh, the Spanish settlements were built near presidios, um, and also the missions as well. Now, in Alta California, being that it was a, a huge territory, uh, the missions were built pretty much separated from each other, and they had their own. Uh, they had to find their own ways to be uh, self-sufficient and independent. Um, in California, there was a total of four uh, presidio districts, so they had very little protection. Uh, the people that lived in the missions and the pueblos had to uh, protect themselves from native people and other type of intrusions that may, may have happened. Um, missions were to operate uh, as long as it took to convert native people and to create something called a congregation or congregation to create um, a native community to attend and attach themselves and in a way to depend on the mission. Here are uh, pictures of some of these missions. Uh, the first mission on the top left corner is here in Oceanside, Mission San Luis Rey de Francia. The one on the bottom left is uh, Mission San Antonio de Valero, which is uh, also something that you may know as the Alamo. The one on the right, both of them is the same mission. The one on the top right and top and bottom right is uh, Mission San Gabriel, San, San Javier, uh, to the next, uh, and this is in the uh, near Tucson, uh, near the Tohano Oram uh, community, pretty close to the border with uh, Mexico today. These missions uh, had a population uh, living there and a population that they tried to recruit. Uh, they also uh, depended on the military forts, also known as presidios. Um, and it's important to understand who were the soldiers that lived in these missions. Who were the soldiers that manned these missions? Who were the soldiers that uh, uh, protected these missions, that live on these forts and these presidios? It's important to remember that most troops for the Spanish colonial system were kept in Mexico City or in central uh, New Spain, and they avoided as much as possible going to the Northern Territories for many different reasons. The presidios were not well equipped. Uh, most of them had uh, a few, not a lot of people manning, manning them or taking care of them. Um, in total, there was less than a thousand soldiers. Uh, and the soldiers were also the settlers, so the people that were living in these uh, newly founded uh, settlements. Some of these people were uh, homeless people that were picked up in uh, urban centers. People that were criminals and were given a chance to uh, restart their life or to, uh, you know, uh, instead of being in a jail, making time, they could start over in the frontier. And in some cases, you also have native people from other regions that were put in chains to serve as soldiers. And many of these people uh, did not have the weapons, the training, or even the willingness to be in these roles at the presidios. Here's an example of a presidio made out of adobe, which is uh, made out of a combination of hay and dirt. Uh, this is the one in... Uh, near uh, Tucson. The conditions of the presidios were uh, not the greatest. Soldiers had to serve long uh, assignments. They were poorly paid, if they paid, were paid at all. They had very little chance of promotion. There was very little uh, communication between them and other uh, places, so they, were, they had to be very independent. Uh, it's very uh, common, and you're going to read in some of your uh, primary documents uh, how uh, there is corruption. In some cases, the soldiers had to sell their guns and ammunition to survive, and how the missions and pueblos had to 
grow their own livestock and raise crops to eat. A, um, the key number for a presidio to be working properly and be well equipped had to be of a, a minimum of 120 soldiers. Um, and they had to be well trained and well uh, uh, committed to their role as soldiers. In the case of Texas, there was two presidios and uh, only 59 soldiers in total. In New Mexico, 100 soldiers, and most of them didn't have any weapons. In California, there were 400 soldiers in total, uh, in, divided in between 21 missions. These missions were protected by four presidio districts located in San Diego, San Francisco, Santa Barbara, and Monterrey. In Arizona, two presidios and only 12 soldiers in total. So you can imagine the situation here. The Pueblos is where um, uh, the Spanish colonists lived. In reality, the majority of these people were not really Spanish. They were already mixed race, uh, but they had a chance to uh, assimilate and over generations um, play their roles well. Uh, for example, in Texas, at the time of uh, colonization, about 1% of the population was actually uh, Peninsular or Spanish. The rest were mixed race people. This is uh, some pictures of uh, a mission, Mission San Miguel in California and Old Town. And you can see a, an image of uh, a traditional uh, way uh, uh, Californios dressed. There's a dependency between the Spanish and the natives in uh, much of the of New Spain. For example, um, the people that I come from, uh, which is uh, Chichimeca, specifically the Huachichil Chichimeca people, uh, there was a, a, a war that lasted about 40 years with the Spanish, a war of resistance against the Spanish. And I'm proud to say that the people that I come from were never uh, defeated by the Spanish. And in this case, this is one of the groups that the Spanish actually uh, made military alliances with and also uh, paid uh, or bribed uh, the Chichimeca for them not to attack him and pretty much leave him alone. This um, friction that is that exists between uh, the Spanish colonists and uh, native people uh, creates obstacles for the growth of these colonies. Um, and the fact that these people are uh, a long distance away from Mexico City makes things really hard. And little by little, these people become more and more independent and they create their own regional uh, identities, alliances, uh, and they uh, concentrate in their survival and their own personal economic interest. At the end, local cultures and identities are created, which we are going to uh, discuss a little bit later. Indigenous rebellions and raids are very common. Native people come in and they uh, rob and assault Spanish towns. Often they steal cattle. They also steal people and the Spanish do the same with native people. There is something called the Indian slave trade and uh, native people do it to each other, but the Spanish do it for to natives for sure, and they make them into their slaves. Um, and when native people resist, um, they pay the ultimate price. And we'll talk about the uh, Pueblo Revolt of 1680, where you can see an example of um, native people resisting. It's uh, possible that native people will come into a town and raid it and take cattle, take women and children with them for many different reasons, uh, killing people in the way, but then that happened the other way around too. Uh, native people oftentimes had to abandon their towns and move to the mountains, and eventually they end up attacking Spanish uh, 
sediments in retaliation. And many of these native people end up depending on the mission, or in some cases, in a status of conquered and exploited people. Uh, they join the Spanish colonial system. Some of them end up becoming soldiers. Some of them end up uh, getting rewarded for that. Uh, while some of the native communities are able to negotiate with the Spanish and they're able to keep uh, influence over their traditional homelands uh, as long as they work uh, with the Spanish and the rules that the Spanish have brought with them. And that is the end of this lecture. Take care of yourselves and I see you or I'll talk to you in the next one. Thank you.